So I went and changed the color of the flower to something that fit better with the style that that bright pink just was not an art nouveau color. Um, and because I wanted my caterpillar to be the main focal point, I just made the flower bland and blend into the background. The eye goes to him. Um, in order to demonstrate subsurface material, I just created a sphere over here um, because I didn't really have anything in the scene that I wanted to apply it to. And when you use subsurface is basically it creates a surface below your upper level. And it works for things like skin because, you know, the skin that we see is actually a layer of dead skin. And below that is living skin. And so what happens is light goes into your, the layer of your dead skin and hits that subsurface. And it creates a look um, that subsurface duplicates. It also works like for things like uh, candles. Candles have a skin on the outside, but the skin is translucent so that you can see inside a little bit. So like it's not like the whole object is either transparent, translucent, opaque. Um, some can have the, the skin, the outer layer, be somewhat translucent and then have a thicker core. And so that's what subsurface represents. And I just here, I just increased it to one, 100, or one, which is 100%, and I picked a color. And what happens is you can kind of see here, I mean, I know you guys probably can't in this video, but I'll describe it to you. When you do this, you can see an outer layer. And that outer layer is that translucent um, layer of dead skin or wax or, or um, it works for, uh, I'm trying to think of another example. It's that outer layer that is translucent. So light can come in here and that it hits that subsurface, that surface below the surface. And light scatters inside of that and it creates that look that um, it's hard to duplicate or hard to generate with a lot of other programs. And so here, subsurface allows you to do that. Okay. Um, coat acts like if you've ever put nail polish on your fingers, it acts like, like that. Coat is, or uh, paint on a car, that's exactly what it does. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the, the sphere here that I'm working with, and I'm gonna add a clear coat on top of, and again, you can do this in increments. Oh, my computer decided to wake up and freeze up on me. Um, you can do this in increments. And you can change it, you can make it a color so that it contrasts with the, let's make it a blue. Yeah, so you, you'll see when I apply this, this is what the, this is what it looks like on the subsurface. Now I'm going to take and apply a clear coat of blue over it. Maybe let's not maybe make it that dark. Let's make it a little bluer here, or baby bluer. No, nope, it doesn't show you enough. There we go. Okay. So now I've added this clear coat, and you when we and then when we go to render this out, you'll see that what it does is it puts that coating on top of the object, so that it um, there we go. So it kind of acts like a coat of car paint or a coat of varnish or a coat of lacquer, and so because it's a coat and it's um, transparent, you can see through it. And so you can see in this case that this is just a coating of like lacquer on top of the sphere. Now, you also see that my computer is starting to slow down the more complex and the more materials that I put in here. That's one thing that you really need to think about when you're working with a scene um, and working with your materials is that the more you ask the computer to calculate, because it's doing some complex math, it's doing trigonometry and calculus, and it's really calculating the math, the more math you ask it to do, the longer it is going to take to render. And once we get to the animation part, which is next, um, after lights, you're going to have to calculate each frame rendering 
times however many frames you have. And you know, you could see right here, last time I rendered this out, this took two minutes. And in this animation, I have 300 frames. So you're going to have to, if you want to do this, I'm not saying don't do this. I'm just saying be very conscious when you are applying your materials to keep them, um, to keep them to what you need them to be. And that make sure that you can complete your rendering by your deadlines. When you work in industry, you'll have, you'll have servers that you work off of and they render a whole lot faster. Um, for school, we don't, we don't have that. Um, so it just takes longer and it's something to keep into consideration while you're adding materials. But you can see now that I added the coat to the subsurface so you can see through that and you can see it's like I put a clear coat on a ball of wax. And what's starting to happen here is the clear coat is shiny so it's reflecting what's around it. And you can, well y'all might not be able to, but I can barely see. I can see the face of the caterpillar right here. I can see the background the sky, the background, and I can see the flower. And that, that's really, it's really beautiful. Okay, and so that's what clear coat does. Um, sheen is like a uh, fabric. Usually this is used on fabric. And what it does is it, um, yeah, cloth-like surfaces such as velvet or satin that have varying roughness. And you can use that on fabric to make it have that nice sheen that fabric has to it. Um, like um, those 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 fabrics that are um, I, I don't know the name uh, taffeta um, you know the bridesmaid dresses are made out of prom dresses are made out of um, thin film can add a layer of film over your um, surface and it can vary. The values are between zero and three thousand millimeters. And so for this, it shouldn't stop out at one. Yeah, it can keep going. So if we add a thin film on top of our subject, we can keep going with this one. And usually this is used with a map. Let me demonstrate this here. Um, Do this here. I'm going to scroll all these up. Okay, thin film. Usually you would use a map here. Um, so on a bitmap. And we'll pull out lava. And we're going to go back to the main stack. And we'll tell it how thick we want it. And I'm just to, for the sake of getting there faster, <laughs> I'm just going to type that number in because you can do that. And let's attach that here. And I will also need to attach so I can see it. And it's going to act as a film. Oh, it keeps letting me go even higher. It lets me go a lot higher. Okay, so let me render this out and show you. And it's going to take its time thinking about it. There we go. And so by putting it on top of itself, it created a layer of film on top of... Now I use the same... Let's, let me cancel this. I'll use a different one. Let's just use a different one here. Let's use bricks. Okay, now I'll render it out. Index of refraction for the thin film. Let's take that out. Oh, can't take it completely out. It's just the size of that, that highlight. I just don't want that to be in there. Oh, it's making it go away. Now I can see the film is what it's doing, actually. You see how it's shrinking? 
Oh, let's leave it there. I'll show you. So we've put a, a thin film using the lava over the bricks. And as I've reduced that index of refraction, it starts to create like a mirror ball. Let's take that all the way out. And I think if we take that all the way out, we'll completely get that mirror ball. And that's how you create a mirror ball. Take it a second just to show us. Yeah, it creates a mirror. So if you want to create... And I have clicked on the wrong one. Here we go. Okay, so if you want to create a mirror ball, add thin film. And I think I put, let's, that's almost, it's almost 100,000. Um, I put in a, um, a map and I reduced my index of refraction to zero. And you see, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter which map I use. It just gives a little bit of texture there, but it's created a mirror ball. And that's the beautiful thing about this HDRI map that we've put in the background. In this reflection, it wraps it completely around your scene as a 360. It's pretty cool. Okay, I'm going to stop this one here and I'll see you in the next video.